15. The Seraphim The Seraphim appear only once in the Bible, but in a very important context. Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 13, describes his vision in the temple of the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5. The word here translated as temple can also be rendered as palace. It is a palace vision of the throne of the universe, and both J. A. Alexander and E. J. Young so translated the word. The seraphim surrounded the throne and are above it, a notable fact. They are human in appearance, except that they are described as having six wings each. They are clearly throne attendants. This fact tells us much about them. We are not accustomed to seeing throne attendants as more than decorative in our time, because kings themselves are usually decorative and severely limited in their powers. However, historically, any throne attendant exercised great powers for the ruler and hence was a person of very considerable authority. Throne attendants always stood on a lower level than the king. To this day, Japanese protocol is fairly strict on this point. At times, diplomatic problems have been created by the presence of very tall Americans being brought before the Emperor of Japan. One analyst stated that Japanese-American relations prior to World War II would have been made a bit easier if short ambassadors had been sent to Japan. In Isaiah's vision, God sits on the throne, whereas the seraphim stand above the throne. R.K. Harrison says of the seraphim that they are an order of angelic beings responsible for guardianship and worship. They also exercised an atoning ministry, as in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 5 to 7. R.B.Y. Scott read Isaiah chapter 6, verse 2 as... Above him, God, stood the seraphim, but saw its meaning as attendant on him. He saw the seraphim as symbolizing lightning. As the cherub symbolized the thundercloud, compare Psalm 18 verses 8 to 15. J. A. Alexander held that standing above could refer to both God and the throne. He saw the seraphim as, quote, ministers, end quote, that is, as ministers of state for the government of all creation. An important fact, however, is not noted. The cherubim are portrayed as under God. God rides upon the cherub, Psalm 18, verse 10, and he is enthroned on the cherubim. For Samuel chapter 4, verse 4, Psalm 80, verse 1, Psalm 99, verse 1, Isaiah chapter 37, verse 16, etc. God's throne has the cherubim on either side, so that he is said to be either between the cherubim or over them. On the other hand, the seraphim are above God and the throne, a significant difference. The seraphim would thus appear to have at least a higher function than the cherubim, Moreover, while even an ungodly king such as Tyre's ruler could be compared to the cherubim, the appearance of the seraphim and their station seems to preclude any comparison to man. The seraphim in Isaiah chapter 6 gave an antiphonal praise and worship of God. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, The whole earth is full of his glory. Verse 3 Both Calvin and E.J. Young translate the second part of the seraph's cry. The fullness of all the earth is his glory. Young, calling attention to the distinction in theology between God's essential glory and his glory as displayed in the created universe, noted, What is God's glory? It is a revelation of his attributes. By regarding the universe which he has created, we behold his glory, his perfection and his attributes. 
The revelation of God in the created universe, His declaration glory, is sufficient to convince men of God's holiness, righteousness, and justice, as well as of His almighty power, so that man is without excuse. Calvin's blunt comment is also of interest. Literally, it is the fullness of the whole earth, which might be understood to refer to the fruits and animals, and manifold riches with which God has enriched the earth, and might convey this meaning, that, in the ornaments and great variety of furniture of the world, the glory of God shines, because they are so many proofs of a Father's love. But the more simple and natural interpretation is that the glory of God fills the whole earth, or is spread through every region of the earth. There is also, I think, an implied contrast by which he puts down the foolish boasting of the Jews, who thought that the glory of God was nowhere to be seen but among themselves, and wished to have it shut up within their own temple. But Isaiah shows that it is so far from being confined to so narrow limits that it fills the whole earth. And to this agrees the prophecy which immediately follows, verse 10, about the blinding of the Jews, which opened up for the Gentiles admission into the church of God, for they occupied that place which the Jews had forsaken and left empty. The praise of God thus calls attention to the transcendent and total power and authority of God, the Creator King. The purification and atonement affected by the seraphim is not the exercise of any independent function. As attendants to the throne, they must make acceptable to the throne anyone who draws near or who is to be commissioned and sent forth. The commission to Isaiah is set forth in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 to 13. A commission to proclaim judgment, captivity, and then the restoration of a remnant. Thus, the seraphim prepare Isaiah for a ministry of judgment by first taking away his iniquity and purging his sin. As we have seen, the cherubim have a like ministry of judgment and blessing. There is, however, a difference in their station. The cherubim beside or under the throne, and the seraphim above it. The role of the cherubim is oriented to history, to man. They guarded the gates of paradise when man fell, to protect Eden from sinful man. However, under their power and authority, man and history moved to paradise regained, a new world under God. The authority of the cherubim is history-oriented. It is the throne authority exercised to develop the meaning of God's covenant with man. The cherubim, thus, are providential powers, and men who exercise God-ordained authority are therefore compared to the cherubim. The seraphim stand above the throne. Their focus is God-centred and theocratic in an eternal sense. The king of Tyre and other rulers and powers were, without faith, compared to the cherubim because of their office and opportunities. No man is compared to the seraphim, and even Isaiah, God's prophet, must be purged and his iniquity taken away when he stands before the throne. This the seraphim do. All men with authority must work as God's cherubim to exercise dominion and to provide judgment and blessing in God's kingdom and creation. The seraphim symbolise and represent God's authority in its essence, total in its holiness and visible in the fullness of the whole earth. God's throne represents his absolute rule over all creation. And the fact that the seraphim stand above the throne tells us that the focus of all authority is above all creation and above every other creature. Isaiah, seeing the throne and God upon it, cries out, I am undone. 
meaning, I am reduced to silence or to death. The fact of his sin and his membership in a fallen humanity renders Isaiah a dead man, that is, sentenced to death before God. By the authority of God and with fire from the altar, Isaiah is cleansed. He finds atonement. The regenerating power of God comes out of the very nature, being and authority of God. The generating power of God, which alone gives men the power to exercise valid and faithful authority, comes from the highest point in the government of God, from above the throne. It is from out of the throne that judgment proceeds. Revelation chapter 4 verse 5 It is from above the throne, at the highest rank of authority and power, that atonement and regeneration proceed. Atonement and regeneration manifest God's grace, authority and power. As Paul declares, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 